Greetings everyone, I am Rahul Mishra. Today we will discuss about an important terminology when it comes to digital devices which is digital forensics. Now what is digital forensics? Well, it is a part of forensics which focuses on the recovery and investigation of material found in digital devices, often in rela relation to computer crime. The main aim of digital forensics is to preserve any evidence in its most original form while performing a structured investigation by collecting, identifying and validating the digital information for the purpose of reconstructing past events. The evidence here is usually digital data in the form of text, image, document, audio or video stored in a physical drive like hard drive, pen drive, memory card or even in cloud storage. The forensics investigator has to as extract and analyze the information stored in these devices in order to generate a chain of events. Now the question is why it is important? In today's world, when the security of any organization, whether it is a private body or a government body or even if it is an individual is compromised, we need to identify the criminals. In order to do that, we need to find traces of evidence so that the criminals can be identified and prosecuted in the court of law. The digital forensics expert tries to extract the evidence from media or other devices before these evidence can be destroyed. Today most people store their important files in a digital device instead of a paper. People are using digital media to perform their important works like financial transactions. So most of the criminals are targeting the information stored in those devices. It is the job of the digital forensics expert to extract this media, the data and submit the evidence to the court. Now who are these digital forensics experts and what do they do? They are called digital forensics analysts who use forensics tools and investigative methods to find specific electronic data including internet use history, word processing documents, images and other files. They use their technical skills to hunt for files and information that have been hidden, deleted or even lost. They help detectives and other law enforcement agencies to analyze data and evaluate its relevance to the case under investigation. Analysts also transfer the evidence into a format that can be used for legal purposes and often testify in court themselves. Now what are the types of digital forensics? There are different types of digital forensics depending on how you want to classify them. So here we are classifying them on the basis of the type of data we deal with it. That is volatile data or non-volatile data. First is live forensics. This type of forensics is done on a live machine, which means a machine which is found switched on. The main aim is to copy all the volatile data to a storage device before all the data is lost. Second is non-life forensics. This type of forensics deals with non-volatile data extraction and analysis of both volatile and non-volatile data. Now coming to live forensics first. This type of forensics is done on live machine as I told you earlier, which is turned on. The main aim is to extract all the volatile information which may be destroyed if the device is switched off. The importance of this forensics has increased because of internet growing rapidly with all the other factors like cryptography and password protection. Cryptography is used for encryption and encryption can sometimes be beaten by extracting the encryption key from the RAM also stands for random access memory. Cloud storage can be detected and acquired while the machine is still running and unsaved or even physically overwritten data might still have left traces in RAM. Now that is why live forensics is important. Now upon discovery of computer equipment which is switched on, we need to do the following. First, 
secure the area containing the equipment move people away from the computer and move them away particularly from power supply ideally photograph or video the scene and all the components including the leads in the situation if no camera is available draw a rough sketch plan of the system and label the ports and cables so that the system can be reconstructed at a later date consider asking the user about the setup of the system including passwords if any or as and when the circumstances dictate if these are given record them accurately record what is on the screen by photography and by making a written note of the content of the screen do not touch the keyboard or click the mouse if the screen is blank or a screen saver is present the case officer should be asked to decide if they wish to restore the screen now in doing so a short movement of the mouse should restore the screen or reveal that the screen saver is password protected if the screen restores photograph or video it and note its content if password protection is shown continue as below without any further touching of the mouse record the time and activity of the use of the mouse in these circumstances wherever possible collect data that would otherwise be lost by removing the power supply for example running processes and information about the state of network ports at that time ensure that for actions performed changes made to the system are understood and recorded consider advice from the owner or the user of the computer but make sure this information is treated with caution allow any printers to finish complete printing if no specialist advice is available remove the power supply from the back of the computer without closing down any programs when removing the power supply cable always remove the end attached to the computer and not that is attached to the socket this will avoid any data being written to the hard drive if an uninterruptible power protection device is fitted now remove all other connection cables leading from the computer to other wall or floor sockets or any other devices ensure that all items have signed exhibit labels attached to them failure to do so may create difficulties with continuity and cause the equipment to be rejected by the forensic examiners or may also be rejected by court later on allow the equipment to cool down before removal search area for diaries notebooks pieces of paper with passwords on which other often attached or close to the computer ensure that detailed notes of all actions are taken in relation to the computer equipment now the tools that we use for live forensics are we are going to use dump it in this case which is used to dump contents of the ram memory or you can go to nerosoft.net this website provides a lot of tools to extract information stored in web browsers now is non live forensics is a part of digital forensics where data is extracted from storage devices like hard drive pen drives evidence analysis begins on the cloned files of the original storage devices and on the copy of volatile data it is important because people store a lot of information on the drives in protected or unprotected form even deleted files can be recovered which can be great importance for investigation the pr procedure to follow are first and foremost you need to fill the rfs form which also stands for request for service form then you need to fill coc which also stands for chain of custody then we need to calculate the hash of the evidence we need to create an image of the evidence we need to calculate the hash of the image and we need to match the hash to verify the data integrity we need to make sure that both the hashes are same now retrieve data from the image the tool we use for non live forensics in this case will be finex which is used to create an image of the storage media from which the information is to be extracted autopsy used to create information from the image of the storage media volatility used to extract data from the ram dump created using dump it 
Now, there are other lot, lots of tools av available though. I will discuss a case study which was widely recorded back in 2010. The case study is taken from United States. The case is about a gentleman called Matt Baker. Now, Matt Baker, a Baptist preacher, was convicted of murder of his wife and was sentenced to imprisonment of 65 years. In the year 2006, his wife had apparently committed suicide by overdosing on sleeping pills. The suicide was confirmed based on the suicide note left by his wife. Later, while analyzing Baker's computer, the search history of Baker's computer had found that he has searched for overdosing on sleeping pills and had also visited several pharmaceutical websites prior to his wife's death. Second uh, case study is a more recent case study as uh, an Indian case study. It was widely reported in newspapers. We are not going to take any uh, names here because the case matter is still sub uh, This is a blackmail related case study. Now, the accused posed to be a young girl living in Kolkata and lured a non-resident Indian, an NRI, working in Dubai, the complainant, to enter into an email correspondence. Subsequently, the accused began corresponding with the complainant using different email IDs. Now, please understand it is the same person who is trying to lure the NRI person with different email IDs under the guise of different female names which made the complainant believe that he was corresponding with different girls. Having won the confidence of the complainant, the accused asked him for money and gifts. The complainant complied with the request in the hope of receiving sexual favors from these different girls who were corresponding with him. However, after a long period of time when those favors were not forthcoming, the complainant stopped the correspondence. He just avoided the mails. The accused then resorted to blackmailing the complainant by referring to the email exchanges that had taken place earlier. In addition, the accused led the complainant to believe that one of the girls had committed suicide and that the complainant was responsible for it. The accused also sent fake copies of the letters from CBI, High Court of Kolkata, New York Police, Punjab University and so on and so forth. The complainant lived in constant fear of being arrested in connection with the suicide for over a year and a half. He paid the accused a sum of close to 12.5 million Indian rupees to bribe the officials that were supposedly investigating the suicide and to compensate the victim's family for the loss of her income. The complainant was continuously under the threat of being arrested by the police. Now, given the huge strain upon his financial resources as well as the mental agony faced by him, the complainant himself contemplated suicide. The complainant handed over all the email correspondence to the police. Many of them had masked headers and therefore the police could not investigate them any further. Moreover, there was no email that could be traced to Kolkata where the accused were staying as per complainant's version. However, the investigating team was able to trace some of these emails to the corporate office of a large cement company and a residence in Mumbai. A raid was conducted at these places. In the raid, one computer, two laptops, seven mobile phones and a scanner was seized. The computer equipment that was recovered was sent to office of the forensics examiner who found all the evidences of emails, chatting details and so on in the laptops and the computer. During the investigation, property worth almost a million Indian rupees was seized along with cash close to 3 lakhs. The total flow of the exhorted money was traced from the bank in Dubai to the account of the accused person. Now, we will have a demo of the software that we are going to use and it is called Dump It. We will see how we can create a copy of the contents of the RAM and store it in a file so that we can analyze them further. So, we use a software called Dump It as I told you. 
we will double click on it to open and provide admin access. Now just type Y for yes and it will start dumping the contents of RAM into a file. So as you can see, we are done with the dumping process. The file is generated here. Now let's move to the analysis part. So in order to analyze, we have another software here. It is called Volatility. We open a command prompt window in the Volatility folder. For example, in our case, Volatility software is stored on desktop. So we type CD desktop to move to desktop. Then we can use certain commands to analyze. Let's see a few. First, we need to find out the OS, the operating system running on the RAM. For that, we need to type volatility. You can type a few letters and press tab to fill the rest. Then hyphen F space file name. Again, type a few letters and then press tab space image info. Now, it will take a while to scan the RAM contents and determine the operating system information. It will show you a list of suggested profile. For example, in this case, it shows as Windows XP Service Pack 1 64, Windows 2003 Service Pack 1 64, Windows XP Service Pack 2 64, Windows 2003 Service Pack 2 64. Now that we know the profile, let's see the list of running processes. We type volatility space hyphen f file name profile. Now, this is Windows XP Service Pack 1 64 bit PS list. This will show the list of all processes running. Now, let us find out which processes are trying to hide themselves while running. Again, we will type volatility space hyphen f file name profile. Windows XP, SP1, space, X64, PSX view. If you see false in the first two columns, you will know which processes were trying to hide themselves. After seeing the running processes, a good thing to do is to check open connections on the system. So we type volatility, space, hyphen F, file name, the profile win XP SP1 X64 sockets. This is how we analyze the contents of the RAM after dumping it onto a non-volatile storage. Now, what is the conclusion? The conclusion here is since people have started relying more on technology to store their valuable information, a lot of criminal activities have also grown. In the past decade, there have been more reports on cybercrime than any traditional crime. The losses are off the charts. The criminals are continuously figuring out ways to breach security and steal or disrupt the information flow without leaving any trace at all. So we rely on digital forensics and their tools to extract and analyze any trace of evidence that can lead to the guilty.